it is uh, an incredible pleasure to introduce uh, our colleague, my friend, Paul Waddell. Um, Paul Waddell is a professor of religious studies here at St. Norbert. And um, when I was thinking about Paul, I thought of a few traits um, that stand out for me in particular. One is that I see Paul as a font of wisdom. Um, you know that if you've had an opportunity to read any of his work or um, to hear him speak, or if you've had the unexpected pleasure of seeing him cited in some other book you were reading <laughs> and thinking, I know that guy, right? But um, Paul has great wisdom, which he shares um, with, our, with our campus and with the wider world in so many ways. I also see Paul as a beacon of goodness. Um, his kindness, his affirmation of his students, of his colleagues, of his friends and loved ones, the way he cares for others, um, all shows us the goodness that is in him. When I hear him talk sometimes in pres presentations about the dedication with which he approaches each class meeting that he has with his students, I'm called to try to bring that kind of goodness into my own day-to-day -day work. And finally, I think Paul is a friend of humility, which makes this introduction especially painful for him. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but humility, as you may have heard from Paul or from others, is really about truly knowing ourselves. And I think Paul is a great exemplar of that, of knowing the gifts that we bring and have to share with the world and also understanding what our limitations are. Um, so it's my pleasure to welcome Paul for this semester's first last lecture, playing on his own title, Paul, it's all yours. You better get this right. <laughs> Well, good morning, everybody, and I hope you can, can everybody hear okay? Is it? Uh, well, I want to thank Julie for that uh, really beautiful introduction, but not yet. And the reason I say that, uh, if you remember nothing else that I'm going to share with you this morning, I want you to remember this. And that is, if you ever receive an email from Julie Massey, and the subject line says, a request for you to prayerfully consider, don't even open it. Uh, so you, you should delete it right away. Um, first of all, how can you help but not, be, uh, but not to be a little curious uh, as to what the request might be? But even more so, I thought, if I say no to this, it means either I haven't prayerfully considered it enough or else I'm a pretty poor prayer, and I don't want to be that. Uh, so now I thank Julie. Um, but I, I really was grateful when Julie invited me to, to be with you this morning. Uh, I'm honored to do this. But I must say, I, I didn't find this easy. For the last several weeks, I've been jotting down on a piece of paper fragments of ideas I was considering, but nothing was gelling. I had bits and pieces, tiny moments of inspiration, but no clear focus. And so I did what I always do whenever I have to write a talk and I'm not sure what to say. I asked my wife, Carmela, what she thought. So last, no, this is true. <laughs> uh, last Tuesday evening, we were sitting at home and I told Carmela I had to give this talk today and I wanted to see if she would give me any ideas, any sense of direction. And so she asked, what's it called? And I said, a last lecture. And she said, that sounds pretty serious. Uh, what's the last lecture? And so I told her that she had 20 to 25 minutes to share what you would want to say if you knew this was your last opportunity to address the St. Norbert College community. There was a long pause, and finally she looked at me and said, you better get it right. <laughs> so, so I owe her the title and a lot else that's in this. Uh, in thinking about this morning, I tried to imagine it literally. I pictured myself turning off the lights, shutting the door, and leaving my office on the fourth floor of Boyle for the last time. I watched myself walk down the stairs. It's, it's 76 steps from the fourth, fourth floor to the first floor of Boyle, and then out the front door, making my way over to the Fort Hard Theater. At the end of the presentation, I imagined myself walking out of the Fort Hart Theater, getting into my car, leaving the campus, driving across the bridge, negotiating the roundabout one last time, and heading home. But most of all, I picture you. 
I pictured each of you sitting here this morning, each of you with your unique gifts and talents, each of you with your different personalities. I thought of each of you who have made St. Norbert College a better place. I thought of St. Norbert College as a true communal, a community of good people doing good things as together we contribute to something that truly matters. I thought that in a true community, we know that whatever any of us achieves, we couldn't do it without everyone else. We know in a true community, we need one another and count on one another, on one another and are indebted to one another. And so the more I thought of this as a truly last lecture, imagining it as the last time I could say something to this community, the more I knew I would want to say thanks. I would want to say thanks to you for receiving me, for welcoming me, for accepting me, and making me feel at home. When St. Norbert College gets things right, that's what we do. We receive people. We welcome them. We accept them. We make one another feel at home. When I came here in 1998, it was a time of transition in my life. So I was a little anxious and apprehensive. I had never thought of living in Green Bay, Wisconsin in my life. <laughs> now, <laughs> don't take this wrong, but nobody growing up in Louisville, Kentucky, ever thinks of living in Green Bay, Wisconsin. <laughs> uh, it just doesn't happen. But here I was. I didn't know what to expect or whether being here would work out or not. I remember when Howard Ebert was showing me different apartments, he kept emphasizing how important it was that I found find one that had indoor parking, even if it meant I had to pay a little more. When I asked Howard why that was so important, he said, well, sometimes it's so cold here that if you don't have a garage, you have to take your battery out of the car each night, <laughs> bring it inside, and then put it back in the car in the morning. <laughs> now, he did. He told me that. Uh, <laughs> I remember having two thoughts. Uh, first one was, what in the world am I doing here? Uh, the second one was, I'll pay whatever it costs uh, to have indoor parking. And I, I just couldn't imagine that. To say, ask, ask somebody, say, well, how do you start your day? I said, I'll put the battery back in my car. Um, but in a true community, that's what we do. In a true community, we take people in and we let them become part of our lives, part of our stories. And this changes all of us. If St. Norbert College is a communal, that means none of us is exactly who we were when we came here. Each of us has been shaped and formed and guided and changed by everyone around us. When we get things right at the college, that is what we do for one another. We make one another better. We draw the best out of one another. And we make each other pretty happy for being here. You have done that for me. And so I want this morning to say thanks to you by sharing with you what I think we are capable of being and doing for one another when we really get it right. At our best, this is what I've seen. First, we help each other along. Last semester in one of my classes, we read Wendell Berry's novel, Hannah Coulter. The novel begins with Nathan, his father, and his 80-year-old grandfather along with a few others, working together on a farm. When Nathan's grandfather begins to feel ill, his father tells him, walk home with him, help him along, take care of him. Those words drive the story, and I think they ought to drive our lives. Walk home with him, help him along, take care of him. It's very simple, straightforward advice. And it's what you and I are created to do. We are given life not to make sure that everything turns out best for us or works to our own advantage. We are given life to watch out for one another, to be mindful of one another, to help one another along, to take care of one another. We are given life to befriend one another along the way. And so that means we see one another not as strangers, we see one another not as nuisances who keep getting in our way. We see one another not as competitors and certainly not as adversaries. We see each other as gifts, gifts who have been entrusted to one another. 
Here at St. Norbert College, you and I have been entrusted to one another. We can talk about communio, communio endlessly, but communio is possible only when people acknowledge a fundamental truth of our lives. We are given one another to do good by one another. We are given one another to help each other along, to draw one another more fully to life. And since we are each other neighbors, we are given each other to love one another. For 15 weeks of a semester, faculty are entrusted with students they didn't choose but have been given. We may never see these students again, but for 15 weeks, we are called to attend to them, to help them along, to do good by them, and to love them. The same is true with people we work with day after day, year after year. We've been entrusted to one another. We are called to see one another as gifts. This is, isn't easy because after a while, our vision can become pinched and selective. We can start to take one another for granted. We can assume what we know of a person is all there is to know about them. We can get bored with one another, dismissive of one another, or start seeing one another in less than charitable ways. But then we aren't seeing what we need to see. What we need to see is the sacred mystery that lives at the heart of every person in this community. We need to see the sacred mystery that lives in the heart of every member here. And if we don't see it right away, we have to keep looking. What we need to see is that no matter where we are in our lives, we meet one another along the way. We get things right when we don't pass one another by, but when we reach out to one another and have time for one another. We get things right when we affirm and encourage one another, when we build one another up. We get things right when we look for ways to bless. Now, there's not a single day that I don't need a blessing, but it's not just me. I think it's all of us. We live to bless and to be blessed. That should be the rhythm of our lives, to bless and to be blessed. At St. Norbert College, we get things right when that's what we do for one another. At the end of a Friday class, students bless me if after her having heard me wish them a good weekend, somebody says, you have a good weekend too, Dr. Waddell. Now see, it doesn't take much. <laughs> see, see. When it comes to blessing, big or small, I'll take them all. So uh, any blessing I think is a good one. Uh, but it's true, we bless one another when we take time to ask how somebody is doing and then listen to what they have to say. We bless one another when we take a moment to thank someone for what they do and let them know they are appreciated. We bless one another when we pass on a compliment we heard about a colleague. We bless one another when we look for ways to help people in their struggles and to let them know there are reasons to hope. In all these ways, we help one another along. Second, I think we're at our best at the college and we get things right when we're not afraid to practice resurrection. I know that sounds slightly exotic. Uh, so <laughs> let me explain what I mean by that, to practice resurrection. It's really simple. We practice resurrection when we look for ways to call one another to life. We practice resurrection when we have an insight into what would be good for someone and act on it. Here's an example. Every year before my birthday or at Christmas, my wife, Carmela, asks me what I want. My answer is monotonous, monotonously the same. I tell her I want books. So a gift certificate to a bookstore or money to buy books would be just fine. Well, she responds by reminding me that I already have more than enough books. <laughs> uh, books I'll never read, which is true, but books is what I want. Well, the Christmas before last, it was time for us to give each other our gifts. Well, Carmela walks into the room with this enormous box, a box so big and heavy she could barely handle it. I had no idea what was inside. When I opened the box, I discovered not books, but a bowling ball. <laughs> uh, never thought that was in the box. But not just a bowling ball, also a bag for my bowling ball. And not just a bag for my bowling ball, but bowling shoes. My bowling ball even has my name uh, inscribed on it. So, 
Now, I can assure you that I never once asked for a bowling ball in my life. Uh, I've never even thought of asking for a bowling ball. And I've never felt I needed a bowling ball, <laughs> simply because I hardly ever go bowling. Uh, so I figure people who need bowling balls are people who actually bowl. And that, but now I had one. Well, the gift remained in the box until this past Christmas, when Carmela and I finally went bowling. To my amazement, my score of the first game was far better than I usually bowl, so I thought my new bowling ball had really made a difference. Uh, I, I even thought if only I'd had a bowling ball years ago, you know, all those uh, missed opportunities. But the second game, my score had drooped to its usual level. But we had fun. We were laughing and enjoying ourselves, something that would not have happened if Carmela had given me the books I requested instead of a bowling ball. By buying me the bowling ball, she practiced resurrection. She brought me more fully to life. She had an insight into what would be good for me, and she acted on it. At St. Norbert College, we get things right when we find ways to do this for one another. We give life to one another. We practice resurrection when we use our intelligence and imagination and creativity to help one another prosper. We practice resurrection when we approach each day not by asking, what's in it for me, but how can I do good here? How am I needed? How can I help? We practice resurrection when we are genuinely happy when things go well for others. We practice resurrection when we find our identity, not so much in our achievements, but in being instruments of God's love, goodness, and grace for others. Many years ago, I heard about a novel named Picnic in Babylon. I never read the novel, and I don't know who wrote it. But supposedly, there's a line in the novel that asks, Whom have you raised from the dead today? Whom have you raised from the dead today? St. Arbor College is like any real community. Its members are gifted and blessed, but some are also hurting. Its members have known joy and life in moments of great exhilaration, but they have also known grief and sorrow and maybe even desolation. Everybody carries some wound. Each one of us has something that needs to be healed or mended or restored. St. Thomas Aquinas said that God's power was God's compassion, that God's omnipotence was God's mercy. The same is true for us. We're, we are at our best when we don't deny or ignore the wounds, the hurts and sorrows of those around us, but when we do what we can to help them mend, heal, and find their way back to life. We are at our best when we practice resurrection in whatever way it might be needed. That same Christmas Carmela gave me the bowling ball, I drove down to Louisville to visit my parents. My dad is now 89, and mom will be 88 in a few months. They're at the age when they spend a lot of time recollecting the narrative of their lives. One morning, the three of us were sitting in the den of their home, and mom and dad were reminiscing on different chapters of their lives. At one point, my dad turned to me and said, God has been very charitable to me. I was struck by what my father said because he didn't have an easy life. His father abandoned dad and his mom when dad was about four years old. This was in the late 1920s. His mom, now a single parent, had no education and no money. So they had to navigate the, the depression years together. After high school, dad was drafted into the army and sent to Europe in the Second World War. Then mom and he got married and had the nine of us. I know sometimes we disappointed them and we let them down. But still that statement, God has been very charitable to me, is what dad chose as the most fitting summary of his life. I would hope that all of us someday are able to say that as well. Things don't always work out the way we would like, and our lives can take detours we never expected and probably never cho would never choose. We might not have the life we thought we would have and perhaps even hoped for, but still, we've been blessed. I think we get it right when we take that to heart. Thank you.